Hi, and thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Health Essentials Podcast. My name is Kate Caput, and I'll be your host. Today, we're talking to dermatologist Melissa Pilliang about skincare tips, tricks, and trends. Skincare is one of the hottest topics on social media, with sites like TikTok and Reddit full of advice and ideas about what you can do to get smooth, glowing, ageless skin. But it can feel nearly impossible to wade through all of the options, to sort fact from fiction, and to figure out what's actually best for you and your skin type. Dr. Pilliang is here today to walk you through some of your most pressing skincare questions. Dr. Pilliang, thanks so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I always like to start by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about themselves. So if you could just tell us, you know, kind of what kind of work do you do here at the Cleveland Clinic? What kind of patients do you typically see? Yeah, so I'm a dermatologist. I see primarily outpatients. So patients who just come in for routine things and go home at the end of our visit. I take care of patients from birth to, to the very elderly. But my special interest is in patients who have hair loss, patients who have um, hormonal abnormalities, and women's skin health. Okay, great. So, you know, this is, like I said, a, a topic that is all over the internet, super popular on social media, um, and people have a lot of questions, right? It's tough to figure out what's what. So this is one that I'm personally really interested in, and I'm looking forward to digging in with you. Um, so I want to start with kind of a basic question, and this is a phrase that we hear all over the place in every skincare story, and not totally clear to all of us what it is. What can you tell us about the term the skin barrier? What is the skin barrier and what does it do? So the skin barrier is the basically the outer layer of the skin. It's, it's dead. It's not alive. It's dead cells and lipids and proteins and fats that help protect our skin from the environment. So it works to keep water in and it works to keep chemicals and infectious bacteria and things out. So it's very important for our skin health. And so what kind of conditions can impact your skin barrier? And how do you know, like if your skin barrier is damaged, what does that mean? Yeah, so many things can impact your skin barrier. So using harsh chemicals or soaps, using uh, too much exfoliant, scrubbing your skin too much, um, not using a moisturizer can all really break down that, that skin barrier and make it not work. There are conditions that are associated with having a poor skin barrier, things like eczema or atopic dermatitis, in rosacea or adult acne, there can be problems with the skin barrier, psoriasis and ichthyosis or other diseases where the skin barrier is damaged or not working properly. You can, rec you can recognize that your skin barrier is broken down because your skin may feel dry, irritated. It may sting when you put on products. The skin may be flaky or tender. So basically, if you're having issues with your skin, there's probably some sort of damage to your skin barrier. Is that right? Likely so, yes. Got it. And are there, I know that you just mentioned a few things. Are, are there any other sort of basic rules and tips for uh, protecting and restoring your skin barrier? Yeah, you want to be very gentle when you care for your skin. Warm water, not scalding hot. So you can think about the lipid, the skin barrier is like a layer of fat on the skin. And the way I like to think about it is if you have butter on a knife and you put it under cold water, the butter doesn't go anywhere. You put it under hot water and the butter melts away instantly. If you add soap, even with cold water, soap, all that butter goes away. So think about that when you're, when you're doing things to clean your skin. Hot water is going to wash all that natural oil away. And same with harsh soaps. So my suggestion is use warm water and mild cleansers. Look for soap-free cleansers, things that are formulated for sensitive skin and are fragrance-free. That is, I feel like, such a great analogy, like to be able to mentally make that connection. Um, I think that's really helpful. Want to maintain the, the butter that is your skin. Sure. Um, so let's talk about some ingredients that are particularly trendy right now, kind of making waves on social media. Um, you know, some of those things that people have a hard time sorting through, like what are these and what do they do? One that I want to start with is ceramides. What are ceramides and what do they do for the skin? So ceramides are fats, fatty acids and lipids that naturally make up a large percentage of the, of the skin barrier. So these 
are put into products to help moisturize our skin and help replace that skin barrier and keep it healthy. And so ceramides are then an ingredient in other products or do they sort of stand alone as a product? They are ingredients included in other products with other moisturizing substances and oils. So you will see it on the label if it contains ceramide. You, usually they put it front and center because it's a very important thing. So it's the product name, active ingredients, ceramides. And the other place to look would be in the ingredient list if you don't see it on the front. Okay, perfect. Um, another ingredient is squalane. Uh, what can you tell us about squalane? And uh, what is the difference between squalane and squalene? So again, squalane is squalene really is another chemical that makes up that skin barrier. It's a lower percent than the ceramides, but still very important. So it helps to maintain the barrier of the skin and helps keep the skin protected. Squalene is the more natural way that it exists. And when we add hydrogen to it, it becomes squalane. The benefit of the hydrogen is it makes a lighter oil, so it's not quite so heavy and occlusive, and it also gives the product a longer shelf life because the squalane doesn't break down as quickly as the squalene. Okay, and when you say occlusive, that's a word, another word that we hear a lot, you know, when we're talking about skincare. Can you just explain that term really quickly for our listeners? Yeah, occlusive is something that that is very heavy, often an ointment like um, like petrolatum that is very heavy and sits on the skin and kind of blocks anything from going through, blocks oxygen or air from going through and really occludes the skin. So it really keeps all the good stuff in there. It's sort of like a like a barrier. It can, yes. It can also, though, things that are too occlusive can also plug the pores and lead to acne. So it's a very delicate balance. It seems like all of skincare is a very delicate balance. Uh, okay, so uh, back to squalene and squalene, like what kind of products have them? Who should use them? And, and is there anyone who shouldn't? Yeah, so they're in things like moisturizers and cleansers. And you can, again, find them on the ingredient list is how to know if they're there or not. And really anybody with sensitive skin, skin that's prone to irritation, um, is it with dry skin would all benefit from using it. It also has some anti-aging properties. So if you're worried about, about skin aging, it's another reason to use that. And so it sounds like all of these ingredients that we've just talked about are things that sort of exist in your skin already. And you're kind of putting them back in or putting more of them into your skin. Is that a, a correct way to think about it? It is a correct way to think about it. And, you know, as we age, our skin barrier does not replace itself as well or as quickly. So um, a young person can take a shower three times a day with hot water and harsh soap. And that barrier will replace itself in, in six or seven hours enough that they don't dry out their skin. But somebody who's in their 50s or 60s or 70s, their skin barrier does not replace itself as quickly. So using, they may not be able to use it more than once a day, a soap and a shower without significantly drying out their skin. Okay. That's, there's like an internet meme about that, right? That says, if you want to get glowing skin, you know, first be young and start with perfect skin. <laughs> so um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what can you tell us? Another kind of thing that's been all over the place just conceptually is like talking about the skin's pH. So I've read that you should cleanse your skin with a product that's close to your skin's natural pH, but like, what does that mean? And how do you figure it out? It's very hard to know by looking at the product. So the skin's normal pH is about 5.5. So just a little bit acidic. And if you get make it if you get that pH too high or too low, then that disrupts the natural microenvironment on the skin. Our normal healthy bacteria don't grow as well. The skin barrier doesn't work as well. Those lipids break down. It's very hard to know on a product, unless some products will say pH balanced, and that's a good clue that that's a product that you would want to use. Also look for things that are mild, generated, that are categorized as mild, marketed for sensitive skin. Those are also going to be much more pH balanced. Okay. And is that something that a dermatologist can help you with? Kind of like figuring out your skin's pH balance? I would imagine that it's a little bit different for everyone if you're having some particular issues. It is. And if you're somebody who has oily skin, then you might be able to tolerate or even need something that's a little bit of a harsher wash than somebody who has 
sensitive skin and need something that's more mild or more pH balanced. So really talk to your dermatologist, see what they recommend in terms of skincare. Perfect. So speaking of cleansing, a skincare tip that's been popular lately on social media, and I'm curious whether it kind of has any, uh, if there's any reality behind it, is what people are calling the 60 second rule, uh, which says that you should cleanse your face for one full minute before rinsing off your cleanser. So is there any truth to this? And, you know, how long do you usually recommend that people cleanse? The ideal way to cleanse is put your soap on, massage it in, and rinse it off. No benefit by leaving it on longer or massaging it in longer. And in fact, you may do more damage to that skin barrier that we've been talking so much about because the longer the soap is in contact with that those fatty layer, the more it can break it down. Okay, so I've read, you know, people saying, oh, after 30 seconds, you start to feel like grime or like little kind of like balls under your skin. That's not, it sounds like that's not actually maybe necessarily a good thing. That's you breaking down your skin. That's correct. And if you if your goal is to exfoliate your skin, then using something that is a gentle skin exfoliator would be a better choice. You can find this in moisturizing creams and lotions. You can find it in soaps. So look for things like glycolic acid, alpha hydroxy acid, lactic acid are all good ingredients if you want to have gentle exfoliation of your skin. I feel like exfol like when I this is probably incorrect, so I would love your input. When I think of exfoliants, I think of sort of like in the nineties, remember those like very harsh exfoliants that had the the micro beads in them and it was like you use them and you kind of hurt, your face stung a little bit. Um I I imagine those are probably out of fashion and like not what exfoliants are meant to be these days. Can you speak to that at all? Yes, those are not good for your skin. So they make like little micro tears in your skin, which can let bacteria in and, and disrupt that barrier. You're basically scrubbing it off. And that's not, that's not healthy for your skin. The other thing, those little plastic beads get in our water supply and get into our fish and are really bad for the environment. So really a chemical exfoliant with a mild uh, alpha hydroxy acid is your best bet. And you use it regularly over time. If you use it regularly, then that slowly exfoliates the skin and, and releases your glow underneath. Got it. And is exfoliating something that you should do once a day, multiple times a day? It sounds like probably just once, right? Yeah. It depends how sensitive your skin is. Some people who have tougher skin, less sensitive skin might be able to use it every day. If you're somebody who has more sensitive skin, then once or twice a week might be enough for you. You have to experiment a little bit with your own skin type. It will also depend a little bit on, on the product that you're using and how strong that product is, how much acid is in it. Okay. Um, yeah. So it sounds like I know that the nineties are back fashion wise, but maybe the, the weird exfoliants are, are a nineties trend that we can leave, <laughs> leave in the nineties. <laughs> We've evolved. Um, okay. So another ongoing trend in skincare is using facial oils, you know, and I know that this sort of, uh, stumps a lot of people because it feels like, oh, if your skin is, you know, nobody wants their skin to be oily. So it seems counterintuitive to put facial oils on your skin what can you tell us about facial oils, whether they work, what they do, which ones are best? Hit us with your best shot. <laughs> <laughs> so in general, we think about oils as improving that barrier and helping with the, with the moisture management on our skin. And these oils can absolutely do that. They also often have antioxidants in them and can help with oxidative stress in the skin. Oxidative stress can come from sun or the environment, pollution. Um, it can just happen as part of the way our normal skin metabolism works. And so these antioxidant effects from these things can actually help the skin. They can also have some anti-inflammatory properties. Okay, so that sounds great. Are there specific oils? You know, we hear a lot about argan oil, what are the differences between some of the oils? Which ones are good? Which ones might you want to avoid? Whichever one you choose, you need very little for your face. And they tend to, to kind of melt into the skin better than we were talking about those occlusive type ointments that are thick and really greasy. These tend to kind of melt in better. So patients often prefer them. Argon oil is a good option. Again, it has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties and can help balance the skin or skin's oil production. Two others to look at. One would be 
jojoba oil, which again has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant effects. It can actually kind of mimic the skin's oil, the oily layer on the skin and can um, help balance that amount of oil on the skin. And then when you're picking an oil, is it like, do you choose one of them? Do you use multiples? Is there any, any way to decide kind of which one is the right one for you? I would try to find one that meets your skin needs. If you're somebody who's more dry or more acne prone, and I would use a few drops. You can even mix them in with your moisturizer and, and, and then try a little bit before you go whole hog on it, or you might end up with problems. Great. So test it out a little bit. Um, okay. Another recent trend, which is actually, it seems like a pretty age old trend is slugging, uh, or what people are calling slugging, which is basically just putting petroleum jelly on your face overnight. So I know that you mentioned petrolatum earlier when we were talking about occlusives. What can you tell us about slugging and kind of putting this occlusive on your face overnight? What does it do? My first instinct is that is really not very good for your skin, okay. especially if you're somebody who's at all acne prone, because, you know, we look for products that say non-comedogenic. These occlusive ointments like petrolatum are comedogenic. So they plug the pores and lead to acne. And so comedogenic means they plug your pores. Correct. Okay. Nobody wants that. And even somebody who's not acne prone, if they put this on, they may develop acne from doing this. I would, if you're going to try it, I would especially avoid the oily and acne prone areas of our skin, N central face, nose, chin, central forehead, uh, and be very careful with this one. Okay. So now I'm nervous because this is something that I have been doing. Um, and I have just been putting it like on my, uh, like under eye area, right? Where it's like dry, a little bit thin, super not oily. Um, and then on my lips overnight, is there, should I stop doing this? Is it okay to put it on your, your driest parts? I think if you're somebody who's very dry, it's okay to put it on your, on your driest parts and under eye and lips are not acne prone areas. And if you find that you've been using it, do, done this a few times, and you start noticing breakouts, then time to stop using sure. it. Stop doing it. It also sounds like, you know, depending on where you live, right, where you and I are in Cleveland, the Cleveland area, uh, it gets pretty cold here in the winter. We're coming out of the very cold season when our skin is really dry. So it sounds like this might be the kind of thing, right, where during the winter, my under eyes are really dry. And so maybe putting a little bit of petroleum jelly there works. And then once it gets warmer, my skin's not so dry anymore. Maybe it's time to stop. Is that... Is that thinking correct? That is absolutely the way I would think about it. And okay. there are other areas on your skin that also get very dry, especially in the winter. During COVID, when we're washing our hands all the time. Right. So putting putting petrolatum on your hands, putting your hands in, in, in socks. You could do white cotton socks or gloves on your hands. Same thing with your feet if you tend to have dry feet. Like that can be very moisturizing and very nice for those areas. Okay. So those dry elbows, kind of places where you're not going to break out, but you do have super dry skin, seem like safe places to, to lock in some moisture. Absolutely. Got it. Um, let's see. Something I've always wondered about is putting toothpaste on a pimple. I feel like, is this an old wives tale? You know, I, I'd heard probably in high school that putting toothpaste on a pimple is a quick way to dry it out overnight. Does this work? This is not a good idea. And I think it comes from being in high school and not having anything else to do for your, you got this pimple, what can I put on? Well, I'm put some toothpaste on it. But probably what will happen is that you'll end up with a redder, more irritated pimple than you started with, because there's really nothing in toothpaste that is going to help acne. That makes sense. It seems like another one of those things that's like, we've, we've progressed in terms of skincare products. You can probably snag something, even something inexpensive from a, from a drugstore that will do a better job than toothpaste. Exactly. There are very good over-the-counter spot treatment options for acne. Look for ingredients like benzoyl peroxide or salicylic acid. They're easy to come by. They're cheap. They're in the drugstore. And those are much better, more effective spot treatments for an acne pimple. Okay. And so those are the ingredients for spot treatments, the things that you're just going to kind of dab on overnight when something's coming up uh, and, and you're worried about it coming to a head or, you know, just it's already come to a head maybe? 
Yes, exactly. You have to be careful about, you know, if you have a pimple that has already come to a head, right? So it's like a little bit open or like, you know, weepy. I hate that word. Um, Do you have to be careful about putting product on sort of an open, something that's open on your skin? Yeah, that skin is going to be drier and a lot more sensitive. So many of the products you put on might sting when you put it over that. So you do want to be careful once it's already kind of drained, what we call drained. So come to a head and and the pus has come out. Then you're really thinking about more gentle skin care and just letting it heal, backing down on your acne treatments. Okay, perfect. So skip skip the toothpaste. Uh, another home remedy that I have some questions about is on social media, on TikTok, etc. People are claiming right now that rubbing a banana peel on your face can be good for your skin. Is there any benefit to rubbing a banana peel on your skin? So there is no scientific evidence to suggest that rubbing a banana peel on your face is going to help. That being said, bananas are very rich in antioxidants. So we've been talking about antioxidants, so I suppose in theory you could get some antioxidant from that, you know, as you rub the peel on, maybe there's some antioxidant of residual effect. I think you're going to be much better to find one of the antioxidants that we've been talking about and applying that to your face and eat your banana. <laughs> Sounds good. So get a product that has the antioxidants and then consume the antioxidants from your banana. Um, exactly. Great. Okay. Um, excuse me. So let's move into talking about aging. Uh, you mentioned it a little bit. People are always in search of sort of the holy grail of skincare products and ingredients that can slow signs of aging. What kind of ingredients and products do you typically recommend? Yeah, the two I start with that have the best evidence are sunscreen and what we call retinoids. So there are studies that have shown that women who used a broad spectrum sunscreen on their face every day for a year looked younger at the end of that year. And were, these women were compared to women who didn't use the sunscreen and they looked older at the end of the year. So if you want to look younger, prevention is key. Use your sunscreen. The second type of ingredient that I recommend is something called a retinoid. These are vitamin A derivatives. They come in a prescription form and an over-the-counter form. So the prescription forms are tretinoin and tazeratine. You could, if you're worried and want to try a prescription form, see your dermatologist and let them talk to you about it. They, the prescription forms can be a little harsher and require a little more extra skincare. There are over-the-counter versions. Adapalene, which is marketed for acne, but is also retinoid and can have anti-aging effects, and the uh, retinol, which is a a form of a retinoid that turns into a more more effective retinoid once you put it on your skin. It's like converted into tretinoin-type product. So those are two over-the-counter products that are also very effective for anti-aging. Do I remember correctly that retinols are sense make your skin sensitive to sun? Like that you should put your retinols on at night? Is there am I remembering that right? Yeah, so retinoids definitely make your skin more sensitive to the sun. So if you're using these, you want to be good with your sun protection. You want to wear your sunscreen and wear your hats and be careful. Again, this is just magnifying your anti-aging effects. Ret- Some retinoids actually break down during sunlight. So that's why some of them say to go on at night so that the sun doesn't break them down. Then you can get the most effect if they're on overnight when you're in the dark. Okay, great. You remember correctly. I I was going to say, I'm glad I remembered that one right. Um, Okay, so, you know, speaking of sunscreen and sun damage, as summer approaches, you know, people are always looking for the best sunscreen options. Nobody wants kind of that thick, greasy feeling on their face, especially. What kind of sunscreen do you recommend? So look for one that's marketed for face. And for daily wear, look for one that's marketed as a daily moisturizer. Those often go on very nicely under makeup and you know can be seamless and very nice on your skin and also provide some moisturization. If you're going to go out in the sun, I, I like for face, the sticks, they're a little bit greasy, but they go on very thick and very nicely. Uh, my husband will use them. My kids will use them. They're going to provide the best protection, like if you're at the beach for the day, when you really want good protection for your skin, and maybe you care less if your skin looks a little greasy. Got it. So like those are the, when you're in direct sunlight, you're probably not wearing makeup. You're like out having a day at the beach and the sun is on you as opposed to a day when you're like running errands and kind of looking done up maybe. Uh, 
Can you explain the difference between mineral and chemical sunscreens? Chemical sunscreens undergo a chemical reaction with your skin and they act like a sponge and absorb that ultraviolet light so that it doesn't damage the skin. Both can be very effective. Chemical sunscreens um, may be a little more irritating. So if you have somebody with sensitive skin, then you really want to look for the physical blockers or the mineral blockers. There's two that fall into this category. One is titanium dioxide and the other is zinc oxide. Every other sunscreen ingredient is a chemical ingredient. Okay. Um, and what about sort of talking not about your face, but about your body, is there <clears throat> a, a discernible difference between using the kind of sunscreen that you slather onto your body, like a, you know, sunscreen lotion kind of consistency and the kind that you spray on? So both slather on sunscreens and spray on sunscreens are very effective. Whichever one you choose, you have to make sure you put enough on. So it takes an ounce of sunscreen, that's the amount in a shot glass, to cover your whole body. So, and if we think about it, most of our sunscreen bottles contain six or eight ounces of sunscreen. So that's six or eight applications on an adult. So if you go to the beach and your sunscreen lasts more than a couple of days, you're not putting enough on. And we know most people don't put enough on. Right. And so how often should you, on those days when you are, say, at the beach, how often should you be reapplying your sunscreen? You want to reapply your sunscreen every 90 minutes or so. And if you've been in the water and you get out and you towel off, you want to reapply then also because you've washed off quite a bit of it when you got out of the water. Okay. So if you're a real outdoorsy person in the summer, you should be going through a substantial amount of sunscreen if you're doing things right. That's correct. If you're an outdoorsy person, you should be using a lot of sunscreen. Now, the other option, if you say, I just don't want to buy all that sunscreen. I don't want to put all that sunscreen on my skin. I don't like sunscreen. Look for SPF clothing. So SPF. PF clothing, it really says UPF on the label, but these are designed to block the sun from your skin. You might think, well, I don't want to put on long sleeves and pants. It'll be really hot. I wear these all summer. And I do not find them hot. They're usually kind of light fabric that lets the breeze flow through and, and that shade on the skin can be somewhat cooling. So I really like those. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to reapply. You just are out in your sun, in your, in your clothes and you're protected. Okay, great. Um, and so are there places on, are there any places on your body that you're like most likely that you see as a dermatologist that people frequently forget to put sunscreen, like any hot tips of, of places not to miss? So people often miss the areas around their clothing or their swimsuits. So like where your short ends, you may not get all the way up underneath that short. And then as you're moving around the shorts, bottom moves up and down and hits different spots on your legs. And so there can be a band of sunburn. Same thing with a swim trunk or a swimsuit. So I suggest putting your sunscreen on before you get dressed, because then you can hit all those spots under your, make sure you hit all the spots under your swimsuit. And the chemical sunscreens need a little time to work on their, on your skin. So you really want to put them on 15 or 30 minutes before you go in the sun. So again, if you do that at your house, you can make sure you hit all the spots and then you put your swimsuit on and you know, you're well covered. Perfect. I remember as a kid, you know, my dad was bald and he used to wear kind of a big sun hat and must not have put enough sunscreen on his head that day. And he got sort of a checkerboard burn uh, through the straw hat. So that, that's always my, uh, my main recommendation to friends who are losing some hair. Yes. So it is definitely, it is definitely important to remember to put sunscreen on your hat, on your head, on the tops of your ears, backs of the knees, backs of the hands. Those are all places people frequently forget. So I want to back up for a moment and talk about another anti-aging ingredient again, and that's vitamin C serum, which we've been hearing a lot about. What are the benefits of using vitamin C on your skin? So there's good scientific evidence to show that vitamin C has antioxidant effects and anti-aging effects. So it's a very good thing to include in your skin regimen. There are studies showing that when you combine vitamin C with sunscreen, that you get even better sun protection and sun aging protection because they work together. So if any of the sun gets through that sunscreen, it causes a little antioxidant or it causes a little oxidative stress in the skin, the vitamin C is there as an antioxidant to take care of it. Okay. So it's like sort of like a backup to your sunscreen. It's there as like a security guard to, to help remedy anything that gets through. Absolutely. And um, how often can you use a vitamin C serum or how often should you use it? 
So you can use vitamin C daily. I suggest putting it on in the morning because it works in synergy with your sunscreen. And it takes about three months to really see the effects. So use it and be very patient. I suggest taking a picture of yourself with nothing on, no makeup or anything on your face, and then maybe photograph every month and then see if you can see the effects. So that's actually a really good point, right? That I think when people start using uh, any kind of skincare product, they hope to see an immediate result. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the, the value of being patient, figuring it out, kind of, um, you know, tweaking your routine as you go, right? Some of these things don't work right away. So it's it can be a little frustrating because you want your to see the effects of your treatments immediately. Maybe you invested a lot of money in it or you're putting a lot of time. You really want to see immediate results. But remember, it took a long time for your skin to get to this point. So you have to be patient and give these things time to work. It really does take a few months, maybe three or four months for most of our products to really see the most benefit. Got it. And I would imagine that talking to a dermatologist can help you figure out which products you should be trying, which ones you shouldn't bother spending your money on, uh, and kind of, uh, yeah, which ones are going to be the most effective ideally for you and for your specific skin. I think your dermatologist is a great place to start for recommendations. They know products. They can talk to you about your skin and help you figure out which ones are most likely to be beneficial for you. Perfect. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about at-home tools and practices uh, that, that we seem to be seeing, again, all over social media, some that seem okay, some that seem pretty unsafe. So I'd love for you to weigh in on them. Uh, one is home microneedling. Can you explain what microneedling is and why this is something you probably shouldn't do on your own? So microneedling uses little tiny needles to poke holes in the skin, essentially. And as these holes heal, the collagen gets remodeled and it can help with things like acne scars or wrinkles or maybe even pigment changes on the skin. The at-home units have short needles, so they don't go very deep in the skin. The, the needles that your dermatologist would have are longer and they go deeper and can have much better effects. When you, when you use microneedling, you can have risks. So you could get an infection because remember you're making those little tiny holes in the skin. You can have bruising, you can have uh, dry skin, flaky skin, irritation, redness afterwards. So really it's best to do this under the care of a dermatologist. Okay, great. Um, another one that people seem to be trying at home that uh, again, seems to be fairly unsafe is lip plumping using hyaluron pens. What can you tell us about them and the danger of, of using them at home? These are unsafe and should definitely be avoided. So these pens use high pressure air to force this hyaluronic acid under the skin. And you think it's you might think it's the same hyaluronic acid that your dermatologist was, would use, but actually these pens have non-medical grade hyaluronic acid in it. That means it might have other chemicals or other substances in it that can cause inflammation under the skin and lead to problems. The other thing with this is when your dermatologist injects hyaluronic acid, they use a needle and they put it very precisely exactly where it needs to go. If you're just shoving this in with this air pressure, it goes all over and you can really end up with lumpy, bumpy, irregular, uneven lips. So I would really advise against this. Okay, and are in-office lip fillers a safe thing to try, right? I mean, dermatologists do them. You can get them done in an office safely. Yes, lip fillers can be very safe when provided by a dermatologist, but you really want to make sure that the person who's giving them to you is experienced, is trained, knows what they're doing. Look for a board-certified dermatologist as a, as a good resource if you want lip fillers. Okay, sounds good. Uh, dermaplaning is the act of using a straight mini razor to remove peach fuzz from your face. And TikTokers say that it can lightly exfoliate, make your skin look smoother. What can you tell us about dermaplaning and is it okay to do on your own? Dermaplaning is one I think is fine to do on your own. You can buy these, they're on like a little plastic handle and it's a single blade and you can, they're easy to find. You, you just lightly rub them over your skin and when you do it, then you can look at the blade and you see that there is a little bit of dead skin cells and a little bit of peach fuzzy hair. Your skin will feel very smooth after doing it. Again, though, it does disrupt that skin barrier. 
So you may feel a little irritated for a day or so after you do it. So make sure you moisturize well. And then I would not do it more than once a week, just so your skin has time to recover in between. Got it. So this isn't something that you should be doing every day, like to, to keep your, your peach fuzz from ever growing in. You want to give it a little bit of recovery time. Right. And peach fuzz is so fine that when it grows in, you don't really see it. So that was actually one of my next questions for you is I think that we've, we've all kind of heard the old myth that shaving your face for, for women makes your hair grow in, makes the hair on your face grow in thicker. Is there any truth to that? So this is an old wives tale. I just talked to a patient about this this week, uh, it's a, but it's a very commonly held misconception. So uh, I think part of it is because as our hair grows, it gets very narrow and tapers at the end and feels soft. So if you cut it off blunt, like you shave it, then all of a sudden it can feel a little thicker and coarser, but it's really just because you cut it. And one way I think about it is trimming your hair on your head does not make that hair grow faster. It does not make it grow thicker, darker. We know this. So just, turning off the hair above the surface of the skin has no effect on how the hair grows. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I think that's a very pervasive belief. People who are like, oh, I could never shave off my, you know, the little bit of mustache hair around my mouth that will make it worse. So I'm glad to hear that that one's not real. <laughs> um, one that uh, is pretty universally agreed upon to be dangerous that I would I love your input in and kind of your warning on is the recent trend of using what people are calling nasal tanning spray. This is when you snort a product that is made with an ingredient called melanotan, I want to say, although you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there. It's said to give you a fake tan like from the inside out, but it seems to be really unsafe. What can you tell us about this, this product? Yeah, let's start with anything that you're going to snort into your nose is probably not a good idea unless your doctor tells you to do it and it's FDA approved. These these um, nasal tan things are not FDA approved or regulated. The inside of your nose is mucosa, not skin. So it doesn't have that same barrier. Things will absorb much quicker through your nose. And so if there's bad chemicals in there, they're going to go right into your body. So and these don't tan natural they don't tan on their own they make you more sensitive to the sun so you get more tan when you go into the sun so you still need that unsafe sun exposure to get tan so these are not safe i strongly advise against them if you want a tan look to your skin many people think it makes them look healthier and they may desire that look then use a spray tan or the tans that are gradual that come in a come in a in a tube or in it like a cream or a lotion. These work by changing the color just on the outer layer of the skin. They don't soak into the skin. They're very safe. Okay, so it sounds like there are multiple unsafe things happening with the nasal tanning spray. And yeah, like you said, you know, the fake tan, fake tan technology has come a long way. You know, you can go get sort of a whole body spray tan that is fake and safe. Perfect. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about how to store your skincare products. Uh, skincare fridges have become really popular. They're like little mini fridges specifically for storing your skincare products. Is there a benefit to storing your skincare products in cool temperatures? And are there like some that you should and some that you shouldn't? What can you tell us there? They're cute, aren't they? Those little mini fridges. And it can feel very nice to put something cool on your face on a hot day, or maybe you got a sunburn and you uh, want to put aloe vera on your skin. If that comes out of the fridge, it feels so much nicer on your sunburned skin. So there are times that it can be nice to have something that's cooled. Uh, maybe a mask, a soothing mask, if your skin is irritated, can feel good. But generally, it doesn't change the ingredients of the product. It doesn't make them more or less effective. It's more about how it feels. Okay. And are there any products that are like made worse by being stored cold? Anything where it's going to like disrupt the product? So I would not recommend storing your makeup cold. So makeup is meant to be at room temperature or body temperature to be able to go on the skin smoothly and spread evenly. So if it's cold, it may not um, spread as nice and you may have kind of uneven skin tone from it. Got it. Uh, any other tips for storing your skincare products, things that you should or shouldn't do? So you want to store your, your skincare products in a cabinet, in a, in a temperature controlled room. So like in your house, 
to keep it at a nice temperature. You don't want to put it on a windowsill, for example, in the sun, because ultraviolet light can make products break down. You wouldn't want to leave it in your hot car. I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced that. We accidentally leave something in the car and you come back and it's like all goopy and clumpy and mm -hmm. falling apart, it's super gross. So you don't want to store it in some place very hot. You want to store something that's just, you know, room temperature, 60 to 80 degrees um, so that it stays nice. Got it. And is sunscreen an outlier there? Is it okay to carry around sunscreen in your very hot beach bag? Yes, I carry sunscreen in my car and in my beach bag and everywhere I can. So those usually actually don't break down from, from the heat and you use them in there and they work fine. So that is an exception. Okay, great. And how do you know when it's time to throw something out, be it makeup or like another skincare product? How often should you rotate through those kind of products? So some products have an expiration date. If it's past the expiration date, it's probably time to think about getting rid of it. Uh, sunscreen has a three-year expiration date from the time it's made. So you have a little time to use it. But I'd say if you're using sunscreen that's been in your cabinet for three years, you're not using enough sunscreen. Seems like a good rule of thumb. <laughs> Other clues that your product might be bad is if it smells funny, if it looks funny, if it's changed color, if it starts to separate kind of like oil and water and salad dressing, then those are all signs that it's time to put that in the trash can. Gross. <laughs> that is, uh, sounds like a good tip. Um, is there anything that we haven't discussed today? I feel like this is a topic that we could probably go on forever. There are so many questions out there on the internet and in my own head, but anything that we haven't discussed today that you think is particularly important for our listeners to know about skincare products or how to figure out what's best for them? You know, one last thing about sunscreen, because I think sunscreen is so important for people to use. The best sunscreen that you can get is the one that you will actually put on your skin. So you can buy expensive sunscreen and be afraid to put it on because it's too expensive and you don't want to waste the product. You can buy something that's real sticky and thick and maybe it's a very good sunblock, but it's not going to go on your skin. You're not going to like it. So find a product that you will use that you can afford and, that, and actually put it on your skin. That is great advice. I'm sort of always telling my husband, well, if you don't like this sunscreen, we can find one that you do like so that you wear it. So experiment a little, find the one that you're going to stick with and, and stick with it. Great. Uh, Dr. Pillion, thank you so much for being here with us today and for speaking with us on this helpful topic. This was really helpful to me, and I think that it will be helpful to a lot of our listeners. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kate. I've enjoyed myself very much. To all of our listeners, if you'd like to schedule an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic dermatologist, please visit clevelandclinic.org slash dermatology or call 216-444-5725. Thanks for joining us today.